Hello folks. I've been out doing a little maintenance on my solar hot water heater this afternoon and I thought it would be a good time to shoot a little video to give you folks who are interested in this technology an update on how well the system has been working. So let's walk up here and take a look. I'll show you what I'm up to. For you folks who watched my first video, uh, this is a evacuated tube integrated solar hot water heater. Uh, the tank capacity is somewhere in the 45 to 50 gallon range. If you go back and watch my original video, uh, I've got the capacity stated and uh, it's about a year later and I'm a year older and my memory's not quite what it used to be. So uh, for purposes of this discussion you get the idea this is about 45 or 50 gallons of hot water storage. I'm gonna see if I can slip in here and show you this temperature gauge. Uh, I'm not sure how it's showing up but uh, it's reading about 135 degrees F and that was after a nice long hot shower this morning. Now the temperature last night um, when I went to bed was somewhere in the uh, right around freezing 32, 33, 33 degrees F. When I got this morning it was uh, about 27 degrees out in the canning shed. Uh, so we had a nice freeze um, and we did not lose a lot of uh, heat. Um, we've had a couple of nice uh, sunny days. Um, it's average probably someplace in the mid 50s, uh, maybe a little warmer in the late afternoon. Um, the unit makes plenty of hot water as long as the sun is shining. Uh, if you get some overcast, the uh, output of the unit falls off and the more overcast it is, uh, the more drastically the output seems to, to fall off. So, uh, if you're considering this technology, if you're interested in it, and you decide to install a unit like this, uh, if you expect to take a hot shower every morning regardless of what the weather's doing in terms of the sun being out or not, uh, you most certainly need to have some type of uh, backup plan in terms of how to heat your water. Uh, now there is a neat feature that was uh, standard on this particular unit and I also mentioned this in the first video. Uh, there's actually a, a heating element built into this heater um, and it's relatively small I think it's uh, probably 1500 watts uh, the problem for me is there is no power out on this end of the property uh, so using the backup heating element inside the tank was not an option for me um, and my backup is the original gas water heater here in the summer shower that sits in this enclosure on the back of the shower. This is just a standard um, LP gas water heater that you can get from any big box home improvement store. And you can see the, uh, the plumbing um, arrangement. Uh, it looks a lot more complicated than it actually is. Um, one of the reasons that uh, the, the plumbing looks a little more um, tangled up than it normally would be is because uh, there is no heat out in this building um, and when the weather starts turning off cold and we move into the freeze season um, the system is actually plumbed and all of the pipes are routed so that I can open a few valves and uh, gravity will drain all of the water from the fixtures and uh, the plumbing 
so I don't end up with frozen and burst water lines. So, um, about a year, I think it's been 11 months or so since I posted that original video, uh, but it's close enough to a year for me. Um, I, my personal opinion is that uh, this is good technology. Uh, I haven't had any problems in terms of uh, equipment failures or glitches or the uh, as far as the collector system itself goes, uh, it's been zero maintenance. Um, you can see the finish is holding up relatively well. This particular manufacturer used uh, aluminum for the uh, stand. Uh, there's actually a stainless steel skin on the outside of this tank uh, and then a stainless steel inner tank. So it's well insulated. Uh, it, it holds the heat well. As I said, uh, 27 degrees this morning uh, in the canning shed. Um, and this morning when I got up uh, to take a shower, my routine is to come out and turn all of the valves and get the water cut on and pressurized. Um, I had 140 degree water and after a nice long shower this morning I've got 135 degree water in the tank. And I suspect by the time the sun finally sets, um, I'll have 140 degree water in the tank uh, this evening as well. Let me show you uh, what I'm doing on these tubes here, uh, and this will give you folks who are curious about this technology a little better idea of how these things work as well. Um, I didn't uh, talk about the, the, the innards of these uh, solar collector tubes in the first video uh, because I had already assembled the heater by the time I got around to making the video. But what I'm doing now is Inside this, uh, inside this collector tube, uh, there is a, uh, a a copper tube, and it's actually called a heat pipe. And this heat pipe runs down the entire length of this glass evacuated glass tube, um, and it's uh, probably I don't know four feet, um, four and a half feet long. Um, it's sealed on. Uh, the lower end it's actually crimped off and sealed <clears throat> and then up on the top of the heat pipe there's actually a little bulb uh, which is also made out of copper and it is uh, there's a joint right here where it's sweat onto the copper pipe <clears throat> excuse me inside this uh, piece of copper tubing uh, they use I believe acetone um, and this is a sealed pipe. Uh, it's, it's sealed on both ends of the pipe uh, and there's acetone inside this um, copper tube. Um, another component um, of this arrangement is slide these out so you can see them. Uh, these are actually aluminum heat fins and if you can see, I don't know how well the camera is going to catch all this, but if you can see uh, these uh, aluminum heat fins actually contact the inside, the inner wall of this double wall glass tube. Um, and then the copper heat pipe sits in between the uh, aluminum heat fins. And this arrangement is to transfer the heat energy uh, from the inside of that glass wall um, from the heat fins into the copper pipe. Um, the action of the, uh, the whole configuration uh, goes like this. This is a double walled glass vessel, uh, not unlike a thermos bottle is probably a good analogy. The outside wall is clear and the inside wall is coated with a material that absorbs the solar energy that is shining on the tube um, throughout the day. Um, the idea of the vacuum between the outer wall and the inner wall is to uh, prevent energy loss um, 
you want to capture as much as that of that solar energy as you possibly can. So in the summertime, it's not a big issue, but in the wintertime, when the ambient temperature tends to be low, uh, you could lose a lot of heat before it ever got transferred into the heat pipe. So this tube is actually evacuated. Um, the heat from the sun is absorbed into that material on the inner wall. It's transferred to these aluminum heat fins, which in turn transfers it to the heat pipe. Now remember I said earlier there's um, uh, acetone inside this copper pipe. Uh, what happens is the acetone boils as that solar energy is transferred into the copper tube. As it boils, it actually raises up this um, copper pipe until that energy ends up in this bulb. And this bulb, let's see if I can show you this, actually sits up inside a manifold. And it may not be real clear, uh, but inside uh, the base of the uh, hot water tank, uh, there's a manifold. And there's a copper jacket um, inside that hole. What you're looking at is actually a real good shot of the uh, insulation between the inner and the outer tank. But then up at the top in the center, uh, there's actually another hole, and that's a copper sleeve um, that's uh, a manifold. And all of the uh, all of the heat tubes, if you look at these, this arrangement, all of these uh, heat tubes and collector tubes plug into that same manifold. And that's the way that the solar energy is transferred into the water. And you'll notice <clears throat> this bulb is the proper size to slip into that hole in the manifold. Uh, when the acetone boils, um, it vaporizes the hot um, acetone, is forced up to the bulb. Um, Normally when that bulb is sitting in the manifold, <clears throat> there's water, uh, cooler water uh, in that um, manifold or surrounding that manifold. And that causes the um, gaseous uh, acetone to cool down. And when it cools down, it reliquifies and it drops back down the heat pipe. So you have kind of this little um, pump action going on. Uh, as that acetone warms up and cools down and the energy gets transferred from the manifold in the tank into the water that surrounds the uh, manifold. So basically no moving parts, uh, great efficiency in terms of collecting uh, solar energy and transferring it into water. Uh, the exercise that I'm going through now is when I put the uh, system together originally, as I said, uh, these little bulbs at the top of the heat tubes are designed to slip into another copper jacket uh, that makes up the manifold inside the tank. Um, it dawned on me that um, there's a certain amount of clearance, and granted it's not very much clearance, <clears throat> but there's a certain amount of clearance between uh, this bulb uh, and the jacket inside the manifold where the bulb uh, slips into. So what I'm doing is I'm taking each collector tube out and I am uh, putting a little bit of heat sink compound. And I don't know if you can see this, uh, but this is basically just heat sink compound, it's a grease, maybe I, I can kind of read that on the screen so hopefully you get the idea, but this is just a grease um, and it's used 
mainly in the electronics industry. And um, it is fantastic at transferring heat between uh, components. Um, if you've worked in the electronics business at all or if you're a hobbyist, you know that uh, high current solid state devices uh, sometimes generate a lot of waste heat and um, you have to transfer that heat out of the device uh, into something else to cool the device down and um, that's uh, one of the chemicals used uh, in that particular mechanical arrangement. So each tube is getting a little dab of uh, a little dab of heat sink compound in an effort to increase um, the efficiency, the, the transfer efficiency between the bulbs and the manifold hole. I think that about wraps it up for this installment. Um, I've been very pleased with the uh, with the uh, performance of the unit, as I said earlier, uh, no problems to report, uh, no leaks around the fittings, um, no uh, major failures or uh, weak points that are obvious at this point. A year into the into the installation, um, my biggest complaint, if I have to be critical about anything at all, is the fact that. The manufacturer used uh, organic real live cork um, to seal the heat pipe inside the tube. And you can actually see um, this particular cork is not in particularly bad shape, but uh, there are several that I have removed and reinstalled that aren't quite as pretty as this one. And this, this whole arrangement actually gets so hot that the uh, the cork is starting to dry out. This cork is not really going to cause any kind of serious problem, um, but it uh, it is not holding up well to the amount of heat that this thing is generating on a regular basis. Um, lastly, I'm going to uh, I'm going to post my Skype contact information in the basement box for any of you folks who. Uh, may be interested in, in uh, installing this technology or something similar to it. Uh, if I can be of any help, uh, feel free to contact me via Skype. I've actually had uh, several people uh, contact me through the YouTube uh, email or message uh, service um, wanting to talk about it and it, it would be, I think, much uh, quicker and simpler for everyone involved if we just had a voice conversation as opposed to uh, trying to pass emails back and forth. Um, if you have particular questions or installation questions or uh, uh, any other thing uh, that you might be curious about, I think it's quicker just to have a, a conversation than, uh, than trying to pass emails back and forth. Uh, one other thing that uh, came to mind before I sign off here that I wanted to mention uh, again, for you folks who are considering this technology, um, I have noticed a marked decrease in my gas bill. Um, and I use LP gas. You can see the big tank sitting right around the corner there under the pecan tree. And I think that's a, uh, I don't know, 250 or 300 gallon uh, propane tank. Um, I have noticed a marked decrease in uh, my LP gas consumption. Uh, my, my biggest use for LP gas is uh, heating hot water. So obviously um, since this is, uh, this is my uh, primary source of generating hot water for baths and showers now, um, my LP consumption has gone down uh, noticeably. Uh, probably almost a 50% decrease in the amount of LP that I consumed uh, over the course of the last uh, 11 months or so. Um, the other thing that I want to mention before I sign off is um, 
This is a uh, high pressure version of this technology. And by high pressure, I mean the entire system is capable of operating at pressures um, that uh, most standard home water systems are uh, operating at. Uh, whether you're on city water or well water, uh, chances are the, the pressure in the pipes in your house is going to be somewhere between probably 30 to maybe 60 psi. Uh, this system can operate uh, in that pressure range, including the tank. Uh, the tank uh, can withstand those pressures without a problem. They make a more inexpensive uh, version of this system, uh, and the way they cut costs is twofold. Um, number one, they uh, they don't use this heat pipe technology. Um, the the tubes, the glass tubes, uh, are actually uh, flooded with water. So rather than uh, this this whole scheme of transferring the heat through the heat pipe and then up into a manifold in the tank, uh, the water actually floods down into the tubes themselves um, via holes cut in the tank. Uh, the problem with that approach is twofold. Um, the first issue is uh, obviously freezing. Uh, if you're in a part of the country where you get down into uh, uh, the sun goes down and it, it has a tendency to freeze at night or it potentially can freeze at night. Uh, obviously, you're going to have problems with water freezing up in those tubes and you're probably going to end up with uh, a bunch of busted glass when you come out the next morning if they do freeze up. The other issue with the, uh, with the non-pressurized system is that uh, they are non-pressurized. They are designed to be gravity-fed systems, which means that typically uh, they're meant to be mounted on a rooftop or an elevated uh, level, uh, and then gravity uh, is used to feed the water out of the tank and, and out the spigot. Um, there's nothing inherently wrong with that, uh, other than most home uh, systems are not designed to be gravity-fed systems, so it will take a little bit of uh, creative engineering um, for you to adapt a unit like that for use in your home. Now, uh, if you have an outbuilding uh, where you don't have to uh, uh, utilize a pressurized water system, uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, a gravity-fed approach. Uh, you can save uh, a fair amount of money. I think they're probably 25 to maybe 35% cheaper than uh, this uh, heat tube scheme. Um, but as long as you are uh, willing to, to um, live with the limitations of a gravity-fed system and you understand the limitations, uh, you can't be in an area where the system is going to be subjected to freezing temperatures. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with the uh, with that approach. I think that's about it for now. As I said, feel free to contact me via Skype uh, if I can help out with any questions you have or any installation issues you might be wrestling with. Flip that around. And I'll say until next time.